Thanks for joining us online today. We are really glad you're here. Core Church is a place of hope, healing, peace, and purpose. And if you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to join us Sundays at 10 a.m. And if we can help you in any way through prayer or support, we want to encourage you to use the links that are in the description. Thanks for joining us, and we pray this message both encourages and inspires you. For those that I haven't met, my name is Blaine, and uh, my wife Lori's with me, and like I said, Case is uh, joining us this morning, and I'm somewhat of a a regular here. It's good to be back. I know many of you, but it is uh, great to be back at Core Church. Good to be with Brad and Laura. Usually, they only have me when they're gone, and for some reason, I don't know, he's, uh, he's here today. Maybe his speaking engagement somewhere else got canceled. I don't know, but anyways... I had a dream about Brad two nights ago, and I thought it was, uh, I thought it was good to maybe share it this morning. Um, I think it, there's some spiritual implications, so I'll just share it real quick and see, see what the Lord has to say. But I, I dreamt that I went to heaven, and I got to heaven, and Peter met me. He welcomed me in, and he said, I want you to meet, I want you to meet the Almighty. And uh, so we went down this long hallway, and as we're going down this hallway to this huge door at the end where where the Lord was, uh, this hallway was full of clocks. I mean, just clocks everywhere, just clocks. And the, the funny thing was they're all going different speeds. Some are going slow, some medium, some pretty fast. And I was asking Peter, I said, what's with the clocks? And, he's, and, and he said, do you see the names under each clock? Well, depending on how much they send while they were on the earth or while they're on the earth, that's how fast the clock goes. So the more sin, the faster they go, et cetera. And so I start looking for my friends, you know, looking for different, you know, looking for Lori's clock, looking for my clock. Lori's clock, pretty good pace, pretty, pretty strong pace, going around pretty quick. Uh, <laughs> mine inching, just inching, you know, along. And so I'm, you know, I'm curious because, you know, in my dream, I'm remembering that I'm going to be preaching at Core Church Sunday, and I'm like, I, I got to find out how Brad's doing. So I asked Peter, I said, could I see Brad's clock? And he said, well, absolutely. God loves Brad's clock. It's in his office. He uses it as a ceiling fan. <laughs> so anyways... I don't know what that meant, but yeah. Well, let's say this together. We've been saying this. Uh, can we put up our, there we go. We've been saying this, what, a couple weeks now, Pastor Brad? Uh, let's say this together. We are not just a Sunday church. We are an everyday church. Sunday worship begins with everyday worship. And so let's read the text this morning. It's found in Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7. It says, the angel of the Lord, uh, or the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things he holds, the seven stars in his right hand, and he walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. He says, I know your works. He's talking to the church, the Ephesian Christians. He said, I know your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles, and they're not. And I've found them, and I've found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give them to eat the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Today we're going to talk about idleness for a few minutes. And usually when we talk about being idle, we talk about physically being idle or being lazy physically or we're not working hard enough. But I'm going to to come at this subject from a, a completely different Point of view, and I think it's uh, an idleness that God is way more concerned with than just a physical idleness. And we're going to talk about the idleness of the heart. 
We see here a church. In fact, Ephesus was uh, such uh, an important church in that day that there was a, a letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, and it became a part of our canon. And Ephesus was a good church. It was known as a church that was trustworthy, had good leadership, that they were serving in the community. So on a physical level, they were not an idle church. They were not just sitting around. They were a persevering church. They were a patient church. They didn't uh, allow false doctrine to come into their church. And yet the Lord said through this angel, there's this one thing I have against you. You've left your first love. That there was this idleness that had crept into the heart of the Ephesians. That though they were busy they were becoming idle of heart, that that first love, that passion, that joy, that that sense of uh, calling in their life had somehow begun to dim. And God began to chasten them and say, listen, I want you to re-engage in a new level. And I think that's one of the, the, the silent things that happens in our lives as Christians, as we continue our routines and we, we go to church and we, we're, we're good to our neighbors and uh, we, we, we give, you know, in offerings and we read our Bible and we participate on different levels, but somehow over time, our heart can lose its passion. Our heart can lose its fire. It happens in marriages all the time. I coach... Uh, man out of uh, brokenness and addiction. And one of the things that I see in in so many marriages is that uh, a man and wife will get married and early on there's all this passion, but over time, this this passion begins to wane. The heart begins to wane. They're going through the motions. They're getting up every day. They're doing the right things. They're, they're, uh, They're friends, but somehow that passion has left the marriage. And Jesus wants to renew our passion. He wants to cause our heart to come alive again. I want you to see that Jesus uh, uh, basically tells us that our human makeup has four parts. So when you think about yourself, there are four parts that comprise, I believe, every human being. And he said this in Mark chapter 12. Jesus said, listen, this is the first commandment that I give you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with what? Your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. So everyone say heart, mind, soul, strength. So those are the four components that we have. Our our strength is obviously our physicality. The Greek and the Hebrew both... uh, uh, define strength as muchness or our everything or, or that, that, you know, everything but our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's everything else. And then our soul, when that word soul is used, that we love God with our soul, that, that's, that word soul is actually the word breath. Remember that God said he breathed the breath of life into Adam. What was that? It was the divine spark of God. It was saying, you're going to be, Adam, a little bit like me. It says that we're made in the image and the likeness of God and that we're made to have communion with God. And that breath of God inside of us is that part of us that communes with God. And we need to love God with that soul that we've been given. And then the mind. Of course, we know what the mind is. I'll say this, your mind is not your brain. Sometimes we think, well, the mind is a brain. No, the brain is a tool that you have to create a certain mindset. So everyone has a different mind. We all have a brain, but we can create a certain way of thinking, or we call it a pattern of thinking. And we see the scripture over and over again saying, renew your minds to God's way. Think like God. Think the way God wants us to think. And so we have to love God with our thought patterns and with the way we think. But the first thing Jesus said that we love God with is the heart. He said, I want you to love God with all of your heart. Now, we all have a physical heart, don't we? But how many know it's not talking about that physical heart? It's not talking about the heart that beats and pumps blood through your body. What is the heart? For years, I asked God, Lord, what does it mean to love God with your heart? What, is it the, the center of your being? Is it the core of your being? What does it mean to love God with your heart? 
And as you look through scripture, you'll see again and again and again that the heart always refers to our desires, our passions, our longings, our wants, right? It says, uh, you know, I think it's in the Psalms uh, chapter 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's how the heart speaks. It speaks with desire. It speaks with longings. And it's interesting to note that Jeremiah said the heart can become incredibly evil. So, so we have a heart, and our heart can uh, be directed and have passion uh, in different ways. It can have great passion for God, great passion for good, but it can also have passion for evil. And then it can be neutral, where it just doesn't have any passion. It just kind of exists. And our passions, believe it or not, have the ability to change, that your heart can change. I used to be an Oklahoma Sooner fan. I did. Loved the Sooners. Cheered for the Sooners. You know, crimson all the time. But I married an Oklahoma State Cowboys, beautiful woman, and want to be in good stead with her at all times. And, of course, her daughter went to OSU, and so did uh, our son-in-law, and so we, I got surrounded by OSU for the last 10 years. And I didn't ask for it, I didn't want it, but because I was so around all the OSU games, all the OSU cheering, all the OSU talk, and now my grandson is a Pokes fan, guess what? I'm for OSU now. I didn't ask for it, but it changed me, all right? So I've learned that your heart, your desires can change. Now, this is important because we all can look into different parts of our lives right now, and we can find areas where our hearts are going a direction that isn't pleasing to God. A direction that we don't want it to go. A direction that we feel guilty about. That we find these strong desires, what we, we might call them temptations that are leading us in certain ways and we know we don't want to go there, but these desires continue to pull us. James talks about that in the first chapter of James, how that our human desires can pull us into sin and sin can destroy us. And I think so often we think, well, I just, that's just the way I'm, I'm always going to be. I'm always going to have those desires. I'm never going to be free from them. I'm never really going to be able to change that desire. I'm just going to have to live with it. And I don't believe that's the case. I believe Jesus taught us that we can learn how to love God even with our heart's desires. And look at what Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 5, verse number 19, he said, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on heaven, where moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in, uh, in, or on earth, and he says, lay for yourself treasures in heaven, where moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, let, let, let's look at this. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Powerful. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Notice he didn't say, where your heart is, that's what your treasure. No. He said, you can know exactly where your heart's going to go by where you put your treasure. In other words, we have the ability to actually change the desires of our heart by properly choosing our treasures. So, 14 years ago, I had desires that were absolutely overwhelming as an addict. I found myself addicted to a life and a world that I hated. I didn't want it. I tried to quit it many, many times. I, it was destroying me. I was depressed. I was suicidal. Eventually, it was all disclosed, and it destroyed my kids and my family and my marriage. 
It was awful. But it was a desire as an addict at that time that I, I thought I could never conquer. It started when I was just 28 years old. I looked at pornography for the first time when I was 28 years old, and that habit turned into a stronghold. It turned into captivity. It began to absolutely destroy and captivate my life. I can remember every new year, every birthday, every time we'd move, every time I'd get a new job, every little thing I could you know, latch on to, I would, I would say, this is the moment I'm going to change. This is the moment I'm going to change. And I could never change. My change would last maybe weeks, maybe months, and I'd be right back to where I was. And I thought, this is a desire that will be with me forever, forever. In fact, I remember a man after my sin was disclosed and Different ones found out about it. One of the, uh, a guy from my church came to me and he said, hey, I want to take you for coffee. And he, he looked me in the eye over coffee and he said, Blaine, I just want to let you know I can't be your friend anymore. I don't trust you. And I have this belief and I, I know it to be true. Once a cheater, always a cheater. You'll never change. And I heard that statement and I was discouraged and I, I actually believed it because I had tried to change so, so often. And it was during that season that Jesus showed up in my life in the most beautiful and the most powerful way. I will never forget, I'm driving down a road and I hear these words of Jesus and, it's, and he said, Blaine, I'm not calling you into recovery. I'm calling you into a resurrection. And he said, basically what he told me is, I didn't come to make bad people good, which you've been trying to do for 20 years. He said, I've come to make dead people alive. I've come to resurrect you. And when I resurrect something or somebody, it is brand new. In fact, the scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. That's the power of Jesus. That's what absolutely changes this faith that we have in Christ from every other religion in the world is that we're not proclaiming morality. Do we want to live right? Absolutely. Do we want to live righteous? Yes. Do we want to live in a way that pleases God and honors our, 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 our family and our neighbors? Absolutely. But let me tell you, the message is not get your life right. The message is die, give up the old life, and let Jesus resurrect something new inside of you. Let him give you new desires. You see, you've got two kind of desires this morning. Every one of you have deep desires and strong desires. See, my strongest desire was lust. I had let that come into my life and I practiced it so long and it got so strong that I, it, it, I was in bondage. I was in captivity to it. That was my strongest. But can I tell you, my deepest desire was to be free. I had this deep desire to do the right thing, to be free. In fact, I remember when, when it was exposed and my sin was exposed, I remember crying tears and saying, okay, finally, maybe I can get help. Finally, now that it's out in the open, maybe I can live into my deepest desire, which was to be a man of integrity and nobility. And I discovered in the next two years the secret to heart change, the secret to moving your heart from just having a deep desire to allowing that deep desire to become your strongest desire. And here's what it is. I'm going to put up a, a picture here. We all have this thing called inspiration where we want to live a certain way. We want to please God. We want to be that, that good man in that marriage. We want to be that, that good wife or that, that, you know, we want to be the, uh, you know, hard, whatever it is. We have this inspiration. 
but rarely do people move from inspiration to transformation. In fact, when I got into the addiction recovery world, they sent me to uh, Phoenix for 30 days. And while I was there, I learned a lot of things. There were a lot of good things. But when I, I remember leaving and I did a little bit of research and I found that two out of 10 men that go to addiction recovery centers actually stay clean and stay pure and stay free of their past. 20% retention rate. So men go there and they spend 30,000, 40, 50,000 women as well. Spend all that money. They come with inspiration. I remember being in small groups and everyone cheering and we're gonna do this and we're gonna make it. But they get back and all of a sudden this inspiration dies and they really never get to transformation. And can I tell you this morning what it was that brought transformation in my life, what it, what it was that has allowed me today to live free from this from over 11 years without any relapse? Let me tell you what it is. It is this idea of repeated routine. We see it throughout Scripture again and again and again. Repeated routine. That if we will begin to engage in a repeated routine again and again and again, that we're making an investment of time, energy, relationship, treasure, which will eventually change our heart. That's why the early disciples didn't go to church whenever they went once a week. That's why we see Paul saying how, that he went to the synagogue as was his custom, as was his routine. That's why the early church, when you uh, read the notes of the early church, in fact, there's this beautiful book called the Didache, which is kind of a practice manual of the early church. It almost made it into canon, in other words, the New Testament, but it didn't because it was more about just practices. It was like a, an owner's manual for Christian faith. And one of the practices that they had is that they, they would pray the Lord's Prayer every day, just a routine and a practice and I began to discover that if God could put some resurrection routines into my life, that change and transformation could happen. That my heart could grow and revive in its passion, and my heart could go in a beautiful new direction. So I'm going to give you three this morning. That if you're struggling with your heart, and you want your heart to grow in passion for Christ, to grow in passion and love for others, to grow in passion and calling in what you do for the Lord. Here's three things that changed my life. Number one, I began to engage in community. And here's what my community looked like. I found four small group programs a week where I met with other men and then a counselor or a moderator for that group and we did life together. We prayed together, we shared our stories, we shared if we had struggles, we shared our victories and as a community, we began to encourage each other in our recovery and in our resurrection and in our faith. I began to find men in my life that I would chase down to mentor me I found men that were living great lives and I remember saying, hey, can I have a coffee with you? Can I, can I have lunch with you? And I just began to ask questions and ask them to, to pour into my soul. I began to make a commitment like never before to my local church. Man, every time the doors were open, I was living in Dallas, Texas. Every time the doors of Watermark Church were open, I was there on the front row, going up at the end, talking to the pastor, engaging with other believers, staying till they closed the doors. I knew that I needed relationship and community. I knew that I needed other people to help guide my heart. It changed my life. The second thing that the Lord said he said, Blaine, I want you to begin a routine of helping others in what you have learned about freedom. So I began to look for opportunities to take what God had showed me to reach out to other men and help them. I remember I was uh, sitting with a missionary one time 
And uh, I just took occasion often to share my story because I found out as I'd share my story, other men would respond and say, well, hey, you know, I've had something like that happen in my life too. You know, what do I do? So I, I told my story to this missionary and he looked back at me and he said, Blaine, I've never told anyone this. He was 49 years of age. He was a missionary overseeing, uh, I, think, I think, about 30 churches in Haiti. And he said, Blaine, when I was 13, for three years, I was abused by my uncle sexually. And he said, I've never told anyone, but from that moment on, I have lived with so much shame, and I am constantly being tempted with sexual temptation, and I found myself in sexual sin again and again and again, and I know it goes back to that because I feel so much shame around that area. What do I do? And I was able to get him in to uh, see a good counselor and get him the help that he needed. And, and, and that began to happen time and time again. And all of a sudden, my passion and my love and my joy for helping others as God had helped me began to increase. The fires of God began to go off in my soul. And listen, all of you have a story. All of you have something God has done in your life. All of you have something that God's up to or God's wanting to do that he is wanting to take and allow that to be shared to help others. And then the last thing, I'll tell you what, I had no idea what this would do in my life. I shared this with Brad several years ago. I began to pray a prayer every day. Now, understand, I, when I talk this morning about Pentecostal, I know Pentecostal because I grew up Pentecostal. I, when we talk about praying, it's loud and it is long. <laughs> if you ever get invited to a Pentecostal prayer meeting, I mean, take your watch off, get some PJs on, you're gonna be there for the night. It's gonna go on a while. It's, it's, it's not a Baptist prayer meeting. <laughs> and so, there was this leader of our Pentecostal movement that, that about 25 years ago came out with this this series that he did, this teaching series that was on video, and it was called, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? And it was all about how Jesus was at Gethsemane, and he was, you know, asking his disciples, you know, why aren't you praying with me one hour? Could you not tarry one hour? And so he put this, he put this thing on the whole body of Christ that he could, like, everyone's got to pray an hour a day. Well, you know, what, what, what he didn't get was this is, right before the crucifixion. Like this was the most important moment of Jesus's life and these disciples. And so, yeah, maybe an hour of prayer would be good, but it doesn't mean you have to pray an hour every single day. Now you can if you want, but I, I got discouraged because wanting to be a good Pentecostal kid, I started to pray an hour and I found myself literally after seven minutes saying, God, I am, I've run out of stuff. I don't know what else to pray for. So I'm just going to pray in tongues. And I just, ah, la, 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 you know, just, I mean, I, I didn't know what to do anymore. And then I read this prayer in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus was asked, how should we pray? And Jesus said, this is how you pray. And he prayed the Lord's prayer that we call today, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I timed that prayer, it's 29 seconds. This Pentecostal boy loves that prayer today. <laughs> Friends, beloved, listen, I, I began to pray that prayer every day. But I'd pray it deliberately and I'd pray it slowly. And every time I'd pray that prayer, God would speak and shape and form some new part of my life. 
He would inform me that everywhere I was going, he was leading me away from temptation if I'd listened to his cues. That he was delivering me from evil. That it wasn't about my kingdom, it was about his. That if I would just be present with him each day, all of my daily needs would be met. And I began to find this passion and this joy of this repeated routine. And most of all, the first moment of that prayer began to infiltrate my soul, our Father. I realized that my relationship with him wasn't a servant, wasn't a slave, but I was a beloved son of the Father. That he was never going to let me go. He was going to hold on to me forever. And I pray that prayer today at least at least two or three times a day, changes us. Friends, if you want your heart to change, to increase, to, to, to move from just a deep desire to actually your strongest desire, begin to put some spiritual routines, community, prayer, reading, serving. Find a place and watch that heart come back to life. <laughs> I was praying that prayer last night with Case. Every time I, we get to take care of him, we put him to bed, we read a few stories, and then we pray the Lord's Prayer. And he'll, I'll say the first few words, you know, our Father, then he'll say our Father. So last night we got to, and lead us not into temptation, and he said, amen. He was like, done, yeah, we're, we're good. And that's okay. We'll keep praying until he gets all of that prayer together. Jesus loves you, friends. He wants to bring your heart to life, wants to bring your passion to life. Let's open it up to him and say, God, help me to love you with my whole heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these wonderful people. Thank you, Lord, that we don't know everything that's happening in each other's lives, but you do, Lord, and you care and you're there to help us, to renew our hope, to bring resurrection where there's been death and pain and sorrow, because that's who you are. And I pray for new life to come today. Lord, I pray as we come to this table in just a few moments and we take the, the, the bread which represents your body and the the juice, which represents the blood that was shed for us, that, Lord, we would fully embrace your forgiveness, your grace, and your goodness in our life. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. We hope this message today has encouraged and inspired you. If you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to join us Sundays at 10 a.m. And if we can support you or encourage you or help you in any way, please use any of the links that are in the description. Thanks again for joining us online. We pray you have a great week.